Hey guys, how's it going today? We are going to be talking about gluconeogenesis. Now in humans, this is a process that takes place mostly in the liver, but to a lesser extent in the kidneys and possibly the intestines. Uh, this is the process where we're going to make glucose. Uh, remember in glycolysis, TCA cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, we were that involved the breaking down of glucose to make ATP. So with gluconeogenesis, we're going to be making glucose from a few different substrates. So if you know glycolysis and the TCA cycle, then gluconeogenesis is going to be a piece of cake. It's largely the reverse of what was done there, especially glycolysis. Most of gluconeogenesis is a reverse of glycolysis. There are a few differences. We'll see those as we go on. So let's go ahead and look at... First, we're going to look at pyruvate because this is going to be our first main substrate. We get it a few different ways. You can see from anaerobic respiration, we get lactate. And then lactate is going to be uh, acted on by lactate dehydrogenase. It's going to be actually oxidized to form pyruvate. So that's one way we get pyruvate. Another is the muscles can release alanine or other amino acids. Uh, alanine, they, for some reason, had it listed separately, so I figured might as well go ahead and put it separately. Uh, that can be acted on by alanine tr amino transferase to be converted to pyruvate. In the process, we'll have an alpha-ketoglutarate going to glutamate. Uh, the arrows going both ways shows that the reaction can go in both directions. The amino acids can also be converted to pyruvate, or they can go into the TCA cycle to produce oxaloacetate. Remember we saw that last time in the TCA cycle. Also pyruvate, it's going to be converted to oxaloacetate by the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. Now this is stimulated by the presence of acetyl-CoA. As you remember last time, there were in a, after glycolysis, pyruvate, if there's oxygen present, can go to direct, can basically become one of two things, either acetyl CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or through pyruvate carboxylase it can become oxaloacetate. So now we've got oxaloacetate and we again if you remember from TCA cycle as well as the electron shuttles if you have oxaloacetate it can't cross the mitochondrial membrane. So we've got to convert it into something else. So obviously since this is the reverse of glycolysis and so we're Instead of starting off in the cytosol and going into the mitochondria, we're starting off in the mitochondria and we're going to be going, we're going, to be going out into the cytosol. So we've got to convert our oxaloacetate to something else. We can convert it to malate via malate dehydrogenase. We're going to reduce the oxaloacetate to malate. Or we can transaminate the oxaloacet oxaloacetate to aspartate. Um, again, it's, going to, it's transamination, so we're going to be using glutamate and transaminating that to alpha-ketoglutarate in the process. It's, there gonna, it's then going to be shuttled to the cytosol and then reformed. So basically it's going to be, if you converted it to malate, you're going to use the same reaction with malate dehydrogenase to go back to oxaloacetate. If you transaminated it to aspartate, you're going to be using the same reaction to transaminate it back to oxaloacetate. So we've got oxaloacetate. So now we are going to, this, uh, this enzyme is new. This wasn't in glycolysis. It's PEP carboxykinase. So that's going to be making PEP. It's going to require an input of GTP. We're going to take a phosphate off of that. And we're going to, it's going to get rid of GDP in the process, or it's going to produce a GDP in the process. It's also going to kick off a CO2. Now this enzyme is uh, induced or stimulated by glucagon which makes sense because your glucagon levels are going to be high when you haven't eaten in a while. And then insulin levels consequently, uh, if they're high, they'll deactivate it, which makes sense because if you've eaten or if you've just eaten, your insulin levels are going to be high. And if you haven't eaten in a while, you're going to want to make glucose from these precursors, whereas if you just ate, you're going to be getting glucose pretty much straight from your intestines, so you don't need to make it. So that's going to give us PEP, Phospho phosphoenol pyruvate. And the reason why it's not going to be converted into pyruvate like it will in glycolysis is because uh, the pyruvate kinase is going to be phosphorylated and deactivated. That's going to be stimulated by glucagon. 
that we have high levels of when we want to make glucose. So now we've got a few reactions later. Just because the steps between here are identical in glycolysis, we're just going the opposite direction. Using the same enzymes going the reverse, direct, uh, reverse direction. So in glycolysis, um, in the later steps we made in NADH by reducing an NAD+. And this time we're going to make an NAD+, by oxidizing an NADH and reducing our substrate. That's going to give us glyceraldehyde 3P. Now I'm going to go over here for a second to talk about another way to get this glyceraldehyde 3D or 3P, and that's by triacylglycerols. They're going to be released from the adipose tissues and broken down to glycerol, which is another component that is used in gluconeogenesis to make glucose. So glycerol is going to come in and with the enzyme glycerol kinase, we're going to take a phosphate off an ATP, leaving an ADP, and we're going to turn the substrate into glycerol 3 phosphate. Then the next enzyme, glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, yep, we're going to reduce an NAD8 or an NAD plus to an NADH. That's going to give us DHAP. Now, if you remember DHAP and glycerol, glycerol oh, I'm sorry, DHAP and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate are the two substrates that we had when we cleaved our original uh, substrate in glycolysis. And triose phosphate isomerase can switch between the two forms, but we're going to use aldolase this time. That was the enzyme that cleaved our substrates in glycolysis. Okay, so this time aldolase is going to put our substrates together and combine them instead of cleaving them apart like it did in glycolysis. So that's going to give us fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now the next reaction is going to be catalyzed by the enzyme fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Name is pretty simple. The substrate's working on is one, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and it's going to remove a phosphate group. So it's going to that's so phosphatase. That's what they do: remove phosphate groups. Now it's interesting to note that this enzyme is inhibited by the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and AMP which is the exact opposite of PFK1. If you have those things, PFK1 is going to be stimulated, but in this case, it's going to inhibit our fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So that's important, meaning that really one of those two reactions is going to be predominating at any given time. So that's going to give us fructose 6-phosphate. Oh yeah, and the enzyme, it's also stimulated by fasting. Makes sense, right? So our fructose 6-phosphate, again, we've got our, gluco, our phosphoglucoisomerase. That's going to arrange our fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. And then we've got another enzyme that wasn't present in glycolysis. That's our glucose 6-phosphatase. So that's going to de... It's going to remove the phosphate group from our glucose. And it's going to go off as inorganic phosphate. Again, that is stimulated by fasting. And that leaves us with the thing we've been trying to get to. And that's glucose. And that, in a nutshell, is gluconeogenesis.